Well, we read about in this book of 1 Corinthians that Paul, the apostle, uh, is one sent by God to tell the world about the good news of Jesus, who he is and what he has done. He has planted this church in the Greek city of Corinth. And uh, while he was there, things were going pretty well. People started to believe in Jesus. They started to trust in the gospel that they were listening to and obeying him. Uh, things were looking pretty good. But then in about the three or so years, three and a half or so years since Paul has been in the city, things have taken a turn for the worse. That the, the, cult, uh, the church that's in the city of Corinth started to be more influenced by the culture of the city than by the call and words of Jesus the, the culture of Corinth was one that valued uh, understanding, having this great wisdom. And so it started to look like the things that the gospel said, the good news of Jesus, who he is and what he's done, well, that started to look foolish to them. That they prided themselves on their maturity. That's how they were complete. That's how they were perfect, is by having this incredible understanding and wisdom that they could flaunt over other people. And when they read about what Jesus was calling them to do, well, that started to sound a little bit childish. Maybe they could have even phrased things as, wait, you want me to love people who can't actually process, uh, afford uh, my life? You, you want me to be around people who, who don't actually contribute anything to me? They're, they're actually just drains on my resources, drains on my energy? You, you want me to spend time with those people? Uh, you're saying that sacrifice is the way that I gain? Oh, buddy, that's just not the way the world works. And yet what Paul is doing as he is around this church, as he's writing them letters, as he is responding to what's going on, he, in this place that thinks of themselves as wise, thinks of themselves as mature, having all this understanding, Paul says to them, you don't. You don't have it. You are missing what is actually going on, what is actually real. He says in this that when he first got to the city of Corinth, that he had to treat them like infants, that's got to blow, it'd be a blow to the ego, right? That's got to sting a little bit for them. Like this place that thinks of themselves as so wise, so mature, so complete, like they're the envy of their peers, envy of the cities around them. Look at us. We are mighty Corinth. Paul says, when I showed up, I'd treat you like babies. I'd treat you like you were infants. You think that you know what wisdom is, that you think it's this way of selfish gain, of getting a following, of, of having power or prestige, but, you know, let me take you by the hand and show you what that power truly comes from Christ crucified. You think you have all this maturity, well, let me buckle you into your car seat so I can show you what true wisdom actually is. What you've been holding as wise is actually foolishness. He says, when I first got to the city of Corinth, I had to treat you like babies. And, and while that's a blow to the ego, I mean, isn't that how we all came to know of Jesus? That all of us were entrenched in a particular culture, that we understood the world by what the world told us. And so when we first heard of Jesus, when we first heard of what he's done, it takes a reworking inside of us. It, it, it takes an undoing of all that we've learned to go back to teaching the basics because we now see things true. We now see things real because we now have Jesus. Learning things all over again as if, you know, we're teaching a baby. The issue in Corinth, though, is Paul says, yeah, when I showed up, I'd have treat you in infants, but even now you are not yet ready. Even now you're still acting like babies. You still seek to get your wisdom, your understanding from the culture around you. You still think that you are this high and lofty person, like, man, the church must be so lucky to have someone like me in the midst of it. You still have this elevated view of yourself. You're still making all these same mistakes as when I first got there. You are still acting like infants. And he says, because of that, I've had to treat you like an infant. I can't feed you food. I just have to feed you milk. Now, I've been spending quite a bit of time feeding milk to a person as of late. And uh, this past week, when I was, uh, with, after Everett finished his bottle, I did what I normally do, and I, I prop him up on my knees facing me uh, to, let's not be crass, uh, to allow gravity to aid in the digestive process. Uh, and while he's there, while he's looking at me, uh, he was uh, doing something uh, for a good solid three minutes that he was trying so earnestly to do, and yet getting more and more frustrated. Uh, he was trying to figure out how to put his toes into his mouth, uh, and he just couldn't 
couldn't figure it out. The toes seemed to stay there, and yet when he moved towards them, they seemed to move with him. He just, he couldn't wrap his mind around it, and he was so upset because all he wanted to do was get his foot into his mouth. And now, that, that's appropriate behavior for an infant to do, right? And in fact, I would argue it was downright adorable. Uh, now, the situation changes, though, if this isn't a six-month-old, but a 16-year-old or a 60-year-old. I mean, what would people say if you were up on my knee? Just ignore that part. But you spent your time uh, frustrated that you couldn't get your toes into your mouth. All you want to do is eat your foot. Acting like an infant is appropriate when you are an infant. And when Paul first got to the city of Corinth, that's how he had to treat them. And that's how all of us came to know Jesus. I mean, they're hearing about the gospel for the first time. This is reworking how they see the world. Of course, there's going to be setbacks. Of course, they're still going to view the world the way the world does, because that's all they've ever known. That's all they've ever seen. Of course, They're going to still be going back to the same value systems that they had before. Of course, their life is going to look very similar to what it looked like before they met Jesus. Acting like an infant is appropriate when you are are an infant. But now it's been years, and they are still struggling with the same things. They are still struggling with getting their wisdom from God and instead looking just like the city around them rather than turning to God for all maturity, thinking that they have it down themselves. Paul says, after all this time, you still look like babies. Now, Can I take just a little bit of excursus? Just a a quick side note on this passage. My my job is to preach the text, and we will do that. But I want to just make a, a quick side note on this passage. One of the things that I've heard in some of the churches that I've been at, or I've even heard it here, is for people to reference this passage by saying something along the lines of, oh, I'm just a baby Christian, or I'm just an infant in the faith. And oftentimes what we mean by that is, well, I'm still new to Christianity, or I'm still learning, I'm not as smart as other people, I still don't fully understand what's happening. And that tends to be what people mean by it. But that's not the situation that Paul is talking about in this passage. He's not putting people down because they're still new or they don't know enough or that they're struggling with content. He's saying that you know who you've been called to be, but you're not living that way. You're going back to what you were like beforehand. I think this is really important for us to get because if we self-deprecate ourselves as just being baby Christians, we misunderstand this passage We misunderstand the work that God has done in you, and we miss the role that every single person has of being part of this church, regardless of how long you've been a Christian or not. And so if we just say, oh, I'm I'm new to Christianity, or I don't know as much as other people, or uh, like, I'm, I'm still trying to figure things out, it just doesn't all make sense in my head right now, that's not the issue that's being talked about here. The issue is, what do you do with what you know? This church has been told, you have the spirit of God in you. You've been made mature. You have everything that you need. And they're still, yeah, but we liked what we had before. We're we're going back to the culture instead. We, We want to be informed by what the city says is wise. And that is why they're called babies. Because it's going back to ground one of to have a Christian life actually means to be a Christian, not just live as you did before with occasional mentions of Jesus every now and then. Paul says to a young man named Timothy to not let others look down on you because you are young. And I say, don't let other people look down on you because you are young in your face or you know less than other people. That we cannot be the church that God has called us to be without you. And don't you dare disparage the work that God has done in you to get you to this place. All right, ignoring all that, let's actually go to what the text does say. Um, And so this is a city, uh, this is a church in a city where they've been running to that to just grab everything that they believed as their value system, as what they understand. They look at the gospel and say, no, no, the city says this is dumb, this is foolishness, so we're going to go with the city instead. They are acting like babies. They're acting like they did before Paul even came to the city. But Paul doesn't leave them there. It's not just name calling. He doesn't just make fun of them, but he actually helps them. Show, he helps show them in this passage how do you then grow? What does growth in the Christian life look like? And that's how we're going to spend our time this morning. Now, I do want to make it very clear that the main thing that Paul is addressing right here is that this church has been dividing over leaders. They've been over elevating them, and we've made this point over the last few weeks. One of the big issues in the church is they're fighting. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. As in, I, I'm going to attach my 
myself, I'm going to hitch myself to this person because in our society, whoever is the best leader, whoever is the best following, by me being part of that camp, I start to look good. And so that drifts into the church. And Paul's saying, we can't do that. That's not the game we play. We're not playing this, this popularity contest. It's not about dividing over leaders. That is the point that Paul is addressing in this passage. Yet even as he's doing that, he's giving detailed instruction as to what growth looks like in the Christian life for everybody. What it looks like to have the mind of Christ for us to seek the wisdom that comes from the Spirit. Okay, so we track him with that. There's a specific issue that Paul is addressing, but the way that he addresses that shows us how every single Christian grows. And so we are going to look at how does every single Christian grow. And the way that we can summarize his argument is by saying that we individually grow through people in the church. Do you see the work that the commas are doing for me? I, I'm splitting this up into three ideas that we're going to walk through. We individually grow through people in the church. And so let's take that first one for us. We individually grow. We see this in uh, the passage in, in the first five or so verses where he's talking to the situation of how they're dividing over which leaders to follow, that uh, there's this uh, bitterment going on, there's a separation, there's, there's no unity of the Christian faith. They're looking just like the city around them. One of the things Paul says is that there is jealousy and strife among you. You're fighting over these different leaders. You're not acting like God calls his people to act. And so while he's talking to the church as a whole, that they're all doing this, I just want to focus in on these two words, jealousy and strife. Who is responsible for any jealousy or strife that's in your life? I mean, we're only able to deal with what is in our own life, right? We, like, while we do see other people struggling, we call them back to Jesus. We, we, uh, are, uh, we have a role in helping them see who God has called us to be. Each one of us is responsible if we're jealous or if we're causing division, if we're causing fighting in. So even though Paul is talking to the church as a whole, there's a personal accountability part as to what each Christian has. Only you are able to control if you are jealous, if you have strife, if you are slandering, if you're fighting. Only you can control if that's being brought to the church or not. While we can help each other, you can't force someone to behave. You can't force someone to live as Jesus calls us to live. So even though Paul is addressing a situation that he sees in the church as a whole, he first does so in a way that each Christian is each accountable for, in which each Christian is each accountable for. So he's speaking into the situation full of responsible Christians who are not living in the way God calls them to that are not living in the way that, that Christians ought to live when they're together. And so Paul says, I could not feed you food. I had to feed you milk. Now, people have ran with this illustration. They're like, oh, there's some sort of secret message that's going on. Like, uh, once you're a good enough Christian or you've been around, then you get the food uh, message of it. As if there's like a second Bible. Oh, you've been in the church for two years. Let, let's pull out Bible number two, which shows you everything that we actually believe. That, that first one, that's just to get you in the, do the door. That's the milk Bible. No, there, there's only one message to Christianity, and that's Christ crucified. And that is our nourishment on day one of being a Christian and on day one million of being a Christian. That is our nourishment. But Paul brings up food to, to, as a way to provoke this argument. You think you're mature. Maturity comes from the Spirit, so you're actually like babies. And because you're babies, I have to treat you like a baby. And he's talking about this issue that they have of they're not growing. They're not growing in the Christian life. And so that's why he brings up food. Food is the way that we grow physically, right? When you're younger, that's how you get the nourishment you need to, to get taller, to, to get muscles. Once you get older, grow happens in different proportions when you eat food. But food is how we grow physically. Again, I think of my, my son Everett. Like He's on the, the smaller side, and so we've had appointments with the pediatrician to make sure he is getting enough food so that he can grow in the way that he's supposed to grow. And that's all the more important because he's not yet eating solids. He, he's not uh, able to process that yet. He is so young that all of his nourishment is coming from milk. 
So the point Paul is making, that you are not growing in the way that you are. So I'm having to treat you like you, like you are an infant, like you are needing the most basic of nutrients so that you can grow from that. Because all this division that's happening in the church, all this fighting that's going on, all these arguments, this jealousy and strife, that's happening because you as individuals are not growing, so the church is not growing. I've had to treat you this way because you are not growing as Christians. And so when we think of this illustration of what then is the food of the Christian life? What is it that brings about growth? What is it that causes us to to not instantly be fixed, but over time grow in the way God calls us to? And if you are expecting something groundbreaking and new, man, I'm really sorry for you. We are going to beat the same drum that we always do. The way that we grow as Christians, what our food is in the Christian life, in the Christian life is first constantly feeding on the word of God, what God has said in his Bible, constantly going back to that, having a regular habit of this being what is inside of us, what we are learning from, what is shaping and guiding us. That is how we grow. How we grow is by constantly praying to God, that it's not a one-way street of him just giving, beaming us information in the Bible. We turn to him, and that helps build obedience and trust in him. And we grow through the practices that we call the spiritual discipline, these things that are in the Bible as ways for us to grow. And we just spent the whole summer talking about spiritual disciplines, looking at different practices of the faith, be that uh, taking a Sabbath rest or fasting and feasting or perseverance or generosity. And it's not as though these things are magic pills, that if you just be more generous, then you're going to be a better Christian. I suppose some people make that argument, but that, that's not what the Bible says, so that's not what we say at all. But these are practices that as we do them, as they become habits for us, as they shape us, they over time remind us where wisdom comes from, remind us where maturity comes from, remind us what is real as it shapes our life and helps us to grow. Because the problem for the church in Corinth, and what very easily could be a problem for us as well, is they were being filled by the spirit of the age rather than being filled by the spirit of God. See, this is the truth for every single person. When we talk about how we are called to make disciples, a big part of that is because everybody is being made a disciple by something. Everything is being made a follower of something by something. You, by being part of the culture that you're in, you're constantly being told messages as to what's valuable, what's good, what should we pursue, what should we protect, what are, what are the value systems that we have, what is authority, what's power. You are constantly being shaped into believing that from the particular culture that you're in. This is not cons- conspiracy series stuff. This is just learning. This is just how we learn things. How do you know what is valuable or good? By the people around you. How do you know what are things that you believe in or support? By the people around you. We are all shaped and discipled by something. But as we turn to God, as we trust in him, as we follow what he says, this counteracts those messages. Rather than believing wisdom that will crumble and fail, we find wisdom from the Spirit. Rather rather than seeing power in something that exploits or abuses others, we see the all-powerful God instead. So we instead turn to God as our as our source of discipleship to shape us, to help us to grow and not be babies of the face. Second part of this is we individually grow through people. That again, Paul is speaking to the whole situation of the church, but he speaks first to a part that every individual is accountable for, but it's never divorced from being with other people. Other people play a huge influence in your growth as a Christian. Other people play a necessary part of your growth as a Christian. And to make this point, Paul gives three illustrations, three uh, illustrations all throughout this passage. The first one, we already talked about uh, babies and milk. And Paul said, I had to feed you uh, milk rather than food. We need people to call us back to what is true. That's what Paul does here in this example. And then the second illustration is that of plants. If we pick up the passage in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, verse 6, Paul says, I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So I came and I first showed you the gospel, first told you the good news of Jesus. Apollos, this other teacher that that I am in agreement with, has come and helped build upon that. And yet the one who's actually doing the work of growth is God. 
Again, Paul is speaking to a situation where they're trying to divide Paul and Apollos. He says, I'm following Paul. I'm following Apollos. And Paul is saying, no, it's God who's doing all the work. God is the one who's, who's making all of this happen. But he doesn't say that, that uh, leaders or other people in our life are insignificant or unworthy. He says right before that in the verse, he says, what then is Paul? What, what is Apollos? They're still servants. They're still people that, uh, through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. That God still calls these people in the life of the church to help us believe, to continue to shape us, to help us to grow. So even though, uh, even though no one is a saved, a, a saved apart from the work of God, someone first told you the gospel. Even though God is the one who enables us to grow as Christians, there are still people around you that help you to do that. Corinth is, uh, or sorry, growth is impossible without God. And the way God chooses to have us grow as Christians is through the people that he puts into our life. And so two questions that I want to ask us to help us take inventory on this. Uh, of not having leaders be too highly exalted, but also not saying leaders or people in our life are insignificant. Two, two ways that I want to uh, ask, or two questions I want to ask for us to take inventory. Uh, the first one is this, are you aware of your need for other people to grow? That there's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. That if we are seeking to grow in the way God calls us to, that's going to take more than 70 minutes on a Sunday. We constantly need people that are pouring into our life, that are watering where other people have planted. And then second, are you grateful for those leaders, for the people that are in your life? For, for the fact that while they're not the ones that are doing the work, that they're still obedient. They're still faithful to the call that God has given to them. And we need them in our life so that we can grow in the way God calls us to. I think of Jean Farrington, uh, who is deeply invested in women's Bible study and women's mentoring, like those who are part of those ministries. Do you share, show your gratefulness for her faithfulness? Are, are you uh, appreciative of the work that she does there? And not just the women who are part of those ministries, they're spouses uh, of people who are part of those ministries. Do you thank Jean for the work that she's doing to care for people that you care about? Or, or not just Jean, but, but Caleb as well for men. And not just Caleb, but for those who are working with students, do you thank them as a student for what you're doing? For uh, Tia or, or John, Christina, or Nick, or Tane, or all the other leaders that we have, do you, are you grateful for what they're doing to invest in you? Parents, are you grateful for what they're doing to invest in your kids? In all of these places, we have people who are working as part of the necessary uh, part of our growth that we cannot grow without people pouring into us in our lives. Now, where things go bad is when people begin to over-elevate leaders or start to compare the uh, two between each other as if they're in oppositions rather than centered on Jesus. We'd run into issues if you said, yeah, Gene is awesome. Why do we need the Zach guy? Uh, well, please don't leave me. Uh, but no, th that's where we run into issue, when it becomes a competition between two people. God is the one doing the work. And we are benefited by people that he uses to do that work. That's the call here in this passage. The third illustration that's used is that of a building, which gets into our final point. Paul describes the church as a whole, all the people within it as a building. So one more time in our sentence, we individually grow through people in the church. Together, as a community of believers, we grow together. And Paul makes this point as he said that I came and I laid a foundation of the building. That I came and I gave the initial telling of the gospel. I gave the groundworks from it. The reason why there's people gathering in the name of Jesus in the city of Corinth is because Paul was sent there. I laid the foundation for this church, but others are building upon it. And let each take care how he builds upon it. Notice how it says how. It's not if other people are building upon it. It's not uh, it, the maybe people will do this. But the idea is that all the people within the church, yes, the leaders, but all the people within the church are helping to build up the church itself. Everyone is contributing. Everyone is helping all of us grow. You all have a part in helping us as a church grow, which comes from other people in our life, which comes from us being personal accountable to what God calls us to do. Everyone is building upon it. 
And he shows this by, by mentioning uh, different building materials in verse 12. He says, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, or precious stones, and then he also gives wood, hay, and straw, that there's these different materials that people might use to build on top of the uh, a foundation that has been laid. Now, I think this is an illustration that really would have worked in the city of Corinth. Corinth had beautiful buildings, like the envy of their neighbors. People saw the architecture in Corinth and they said, this is spectacular. You know who else says that? We do. Because one of the, the common architecture themes that we have, uh, specifically in like governmental buildings or really fancy buildings, is columns out front, right? Like you know it's, it's a really significant building or like bureaucrats work there. It based off if there's columns out front, right? And one of the most popular styles of columns that we still use today are called Corinthian columns. Corinth was known for its architecture. And Paul says, uh, what you are building on top of the church, this idea that all of us are contributing, all of us are helping each other grow, how it looks matters less than, how it will, than if it will last. How it looks matters less than if it will last. It doesn't matter how gifted you are or how much you know as you're building on top of it. It doesn't matter what your skill set is. What are you building with is what makes all the difference. Because think about it this way. Uh, you could have just a beautiful, immaculate origami roof. I mean, imagine all the hours that would go into that, the, the folding of paper, just having it big enough to cover your entire uh, roof, just how beautiful it would look. You can have spires and a swan, because there's always a swan, but you can have it look incredible. How's it going to do in the Colorado hail? It's paper. It's probably not going to survive. It, it could look so beautiful and yet it's not gonna stand the test of time. You can have all the skill set in the world. You could build something beautiful with wood, hay, and straw. You can have something that looks incredible. You can be so talented, so proficient, but will it survive the fires of God's judgment? Will it last? Is it actually valuable? Because this is the argument that Paul has been making all throughout this. This is the whole line of thinking in this chapter. The Corinthian Christians have not been living out of the wisdom of the Spirit or the power of the cross. They are instead, they look just like the world around them. And they're called infants because they're missing that basic call of the Christian life to actually have a Christian life, not just look like what they did before with a few mentions of Jesus here and then. And Paul now talks about how everyone contributes to the building up of the church. Everyone is part of the growth of the whole church. But does it just fit with the world standards? Is it impressive compared to what other people outside of the church might call impressive? Is it just the most captivating TED talk with a tremendous light show going on and smoke machines and distortion pedals? Does it look so good based off the world's standards of things using the world's giftedness, the world's power, what they say is good, or is it actually built on the true foundation? Because though Paul gives this foundation, he says what it is for us. The foundation is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation on it. Are you building in a way that points back to him? Are you building in a way that always goes back to Jesus? Or is it drawing attention to yourself, to other things, other value systems, or is it always going back to Jesus? He is the foundation. Corinth, you think you are so impressive, that you are this incredible city, and yet you are acting like babies. You're going back to day one Christian stuff of looking just like the world around you, of not being shaped, not being guided, and yet you think you're powerful, you think you're mature, you think you're so great in this way, but you are missing what is at the heart of the Christian life. That Corinth, you are fighting over who has the best leader, but God is the one who gives the growth. Corinth, you think that you are incredibly special, but you are special because the Spirit resides in you. Corinth, you are thinking that it's based off of your giftedness or following the best person, but Jesus is the foundation. It all comes back to Jesus. 
He is the one who gives growth. He is the foundation of all that we have. He is the one who gives wisdom. He is the one who makes us brothers and sisters like Paul calls us. He is the one who brings us into the family of God. He is the one who gives us this new identity. He is the one that builds each other up, each other, allows us to build each other up. It all comes back to Jesus. And I found this so fascinating to make this point that Jesus is the heart of it all. It's not based off of giftedness, ours or others. It's not based off of what we think is wise when it's actually all wisdom and maturity has been given to us. As Jesus is the heart of what all this is, Paul makes this point using three illustrations, right? Infants, plants, a temple, the building. Three illustrations Paul makes all throughout. It's actually three illustrations that show up in the life and ministry of Jesus himself. Because what hope is there for people who still look like babies, desperately trying, spiritually speaking, to eat our own foot? Where we look just like the culture around us, where we look just like what we did before Jesus came, when we are not seeing any sort of growth, what hope is there for a person who is still in that place? Well, the only hope there is, is found in the one who came as an infant. Like we read about when Joseph is told of this in Matthew 1, 21. She, Mary, will bear a son, an infant, a baby, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. What hope is there for those of us who are begging for some sort of growth, who feel like seeds planted and it's waiting and it's waiting and it's waiting and it's taking time, looking for flourishing, looking for something more, pleading with God for us to continue on, for us to grow, to, to be past these childish things. What hope is there for people desperate for growth? Well, the only hope is found in the one who described himself as a seed. In John chapter 12, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Here is my moment of glory. Here's my victory. Here's my power. And what does it look like? Is it fighting? Is it him seizing a throne? Is it him just being given a throne? What does his moment of glory look like? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat or a seed falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Unless if you take a seed and you plant it and it becomes something else that it dies, it's just going to stay there. It's just going to be a seed. But if it dies, oh, that's when it bears much fruit. That there is life now. There's the promise of growth, even if it takes time. There is eternal life to come that, that is on hand, on offer, because we have this Jesus who laid down his life so we can have ours. And finally, what hope is there for a church like ours? where we are still going to struggle. There's going to be jealousy and strife here. There's going to be fighting over. We are going to overlook leaders or we're going to over-elevate leaders. What hope is there for a church called a temple to actually be the people God calls us to be? Well, the only possible hope is for the one who came as a temple. John chapter 2. Jesus answered them saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. And the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it in three days? but he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when therefore it was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken to them. See, it's appropriate for infants to act like infants, but because of Jesus, when we see him and when we know what he has done, none of us should want to stay there in that spot. And so we pursue growth in ourselves individually pouring into other people, being poured into by other people as part of a local church that we are committed to and invested in. But ultimately, the reason why we are able to grow at all is because we have a God who came as an infant, who died like a seed, and was raised again like a temple. And with a God like that as our foundation, how could we possibly want to look like anything else? Let me pray for us. Father, we are so grateful for the work that you do within us, for your constant guidance and direction, for your showing us what life looks like in a world that is telling us something contrary. And it's difficult to to see a reason to be different. It's difficult to want to be different when, you know, we look different. 
It makes us look foolish or we feel uncomfortable for standing out. And yet the life that you called us to is not one that is contrary, but it's one that we are always meant for. That it's a life that is rooted in what is true and real and lasting. And so you calling us to live in a way is not us giving up freedom or rights. It's not us uh, losing out on something, but gaining so much more. Because it's a life that you have set before the foundations of the world. It's a life that you have given us all the reasons to, to as our, the foundation of this church. It's a life that's possible because we build ourselves on you as the foundation. So we want to live faithfully. We want to grow and understand that it's slow. It takes time, but it's done individually with others and in the church. So we turn to you for all things, knowing that you are with us, guiding us, and that you have given us the means for growth in yourself. So it's to you and you alone we pray. Amen.